lot of good things happening at Granville Chapel. David turned 30, I turned 30. Lots to be thankful for. And this is also, as you've heard, a really tough season of transition and loss. There's the marshals, and of course, yesterday we were gathered here, right here, to remember and honor Andy Perrette, beloved pastor and friend. We were celebrating the gift of his life, and in the midst of celebrating and joy and gratitude, there's a lot of sorrow. And this morning, I'm jumping in for Paul Williams, who had planned to begin a series of messages focusing on devotion. What does it mean to be devoted to God? He wanted to focus on Psalm 27. I'm just going to read a few verses. Verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And actually, that sounds a lot like Andy, doesn't it? Verse 4, one thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, and to gaze on the beauty of the Lord, seek him in his temple. And that's devotion. Verses 13 and 14, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong, take heart, wait for the Lord. And Andy again whispers to us, God is good, God is good. Those are indeed wonderful words, but I'm going to leave them for Paul to unpack for another day. Instead, I'm going to give you similar verses of devotion from Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Hear, O Israel, you, Israel, the people of God, the ones who wrestle with God, struggle with God, try to follow God through the ups and the downs, through the orchards and the deserts. This is the great Shema, the great listen, Shema, listen. It's the closest thing to the Lord's Prayer that we have in the Old Testament. That's how important it is. Hear, O Israel, you who struggle with God. The Lord, our God, the Lord is one. He alone is God. There is none other like him. Now, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. So this morning, I want to ask the very simple but profound question, what does it mean to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength? And to ask the same question a different way, if Jesus really is the image of God, the fullness of God, for human eyes to see what does it mean to really follow Jesus, to real, really follow Jesus wholeheartedly, uh, undistractedly. I'm going to answer this question this morning, not theologically, but, but personally, reflectively. I'm going to invite you to j- join me in reflecting on this season which has been a season of transition and loss. What does it really look like to follow Jesus with all of our hearts? I'm going to do that by inviting you to join me in looking into the lives of three people that I have lost, three people that I've lost within three weeks of each other. Sunday, August 21st, Erica, my mother-in-law, Petra's mother, passed away. A week later, exactly Sunday, August 28th, it was our beloved pastor, Andy, And on Thursday, September the 8th, Queen Elizabeth II. Three different people, I knew them all. I knew them all in different ways, of course, but their passing has got me reflecting on this question. What does it look like to follow Jesus wholeheartedly, with our whole hearts, undividedly? So I'm going to begin with Andy, 
And I'm going to tell you about Petra's mother, Erica, and then we'll do Elizabeth. So the question is, what does it mean to follow Jesus wholeheartedly? And I'm going to give the answer right now so you can listen for it as we do Andy and Erica and Elizabeth. What it means to follow Jesus with all of our heart is this. Each of us is going to do it differently. None of us is going to do it perfectly. And the main thing is about choosing to trust that God really loves us. The main thing is choosing to trust that God really loves us. And you'll see how much flows from that. So first, Andy, if you were here yesterday and you saw the pictures and you heard the words, you knew, you know that Andy really loved life. He was full of life, full of joy, full of gratitude. We heard about soccer, we heard about birds, we heard about mountains, hiking, skiing, running, whatever it was, Andy really went for it. He seemed to overflow with joy and with gratitude. Uh, I always thought there was a boy-like wonder about Andy. He's a little bit older than I am. But especially going birding with him, there was a boy-like wonder that was infectious, but it made me long to have in my life what he had in the birding. We just give him a pair of binoculars and a bush, and, and he's in heaven. Uh, I, I wish, you know, how do you get that? Um, I, I think one of the things happening there was there was an openness, a straightforward comfortableness with who he was. He was okay with himself. And so when you were with him, you knew that he was okay with you. So I'll just do that again. I, I think he knew that God loved him and then he was okay with himself and so he was okay with you. And so there was an invitation to be okay with you when you were with Andy. There was a humility about Andy. He really knew he wasn't perfect, um, but he did know that he was loved. And because he knew he was loved, he knew that you were loved by God, by others, that everyone was loved. And I think when you were with Andy, you think that's what you were experiencing, this rock-solid belief of knowing that we're loved. And so we all saw this remarkable love for people. There was hospitality like serving food in his home, but then there was a different hospitality, this, this hospitality that was switched on all the time, seeing people and welcoming people and encouraging people, opening up doors for people to serve by serving them. <clears throat> Now, in my role with Vision Ministries Canada, I would regularly gather pastors and leaders here in British Columbia. And so on many occasions, because Andy was hosting those gatherings, um, he would introduce himself and, and we would all describe our roles. And he would straight face, deadpan, say, I'm the lead pastor here at Granville Chapel and I set up chairs. <laughs> I set up chairs. And it was actually true. We often joked that that was the main thing that we all learned in seminary was to how to set up chairs. But setting up chairs is literally a metaphor for welcoming people, isn't it? You set up a chair so that they can sit down, so they, they can be apart. And, and so Andy literally set up chairs, and, and then he metaphorically set up chairs for people in the kingdom. Look, come in, see? We have a place for you. That's what Andy did. I can give you some deeper insights than the chairs. On one occasion, I asked everyone in the circle, what's your favorite book? And Andy happened to be on my right, so he went first, Lord of the Rings. Why, Andy? What, what do you think Tolkien is telling us in Lord of the Rings? Here it comes. Evil is real. God is good. And God does amazing things with little people. Evil is real. He knew he was in a battle. God is good. We know how this is going to come out. And in the meantime, God does big things with little people. And he genuinely saw himself as a little person. And he saw each of us as little people. But then he didn't see the littleness. He saw the big things that God could do through us. We are in a battle. And to quote what we sang yesterday, I will sing of the goodness of God. We're in a battle and I'm broken, but I will sing of the goodness of God. 
We save people one by one by loving them the way that we've been loved. That was Andy. That's how he did it. So what does it mean to follow Jesus with all of our heart? Well, each of us is going to do it differently. Andy could see a wide variety of gifts and a wide variety of people. He could see them in Joe White, and he could see them in Heidi White. Just you know. <laughs> And he could see them in people who are so quiet and unassuming and serving in the background that you never learn their names. And he could see the goodness. And the second thing is none of us are going to do it perfectly. Andy knew he wasn't perfect. And it's really important that we remember that he wasn't perfect. Now, obviously, I'm not going to dwell on that today. But please, brothers and sisters, guard your hearts from the thought, if I was just like Andy... If I was just smart like Andy, if I was just gifted like Andy, if I was more like Andy, well, then I would serve him God wholeheartedly. No, don't go there. That's cheating. Jesus didn't have that advantage. Jesus was weak. Jesus got tired. Jesus felt pain. Andy got tired. Andy felt pain. The serving God wholeheartedly is not in the being gifted. It's in the, again, remembering, choosing to remember that you're loved and living there and loving others the same. Let me share with you some verses from Andy and Marlene and the family yesterday. Isaiah 54, this is God speaking. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet, my unfailing love for you will not be shaken. Nor my covenant of peace with you be removed. This is what the Lord says, who has compassion, feels your pain with you. Proverbs 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, acknowledge him, follow him, and he will make your paths straight. Romans 8, from Lisa Perrette yesterday. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword or chronic illness as it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. Yes, we do. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, depth, anything else including creation, including my sin, great as it is, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ. So God is good and we are not alone. God is not far away. I know he often sometimes feels far away. I know that. But he's not far away. He's faithful. He can be trusted. We're broken, but he sees us and knows us and loves us. Our lives are of great value to him. He's not forgetting about us and getting busy or or looking at the nice people over there and forgetting about you. No, no, that wouldn't be God. He has given us his image and formed us, filled us with his spirit. And his plan A, which I'm not so sure about, but nevertheless, his plan A is that we would be his presence in the world. And that somehow through us, he brings in the kingdom. We carry on doing what Jesus was doing. And what Jesus was doing was believing that he was loved by the Father and then loving others the way he had been loved. So that's what we're doing. 
That's why Andy loved people, and quite frankly, that's how he loved people. It's the way and the source of the way to love. Now, Andy was intelligent. Andy was intentional. You heard the story about training for the marathon with a digital watch, a 400-meter track, and no music playing in his ears. Thank you, Lisa. Strategic, passionate, somehow passionate yet stay safe and steady. He was a leader among leaders, and he was a good friend who made you feel seen, cared for. That was Andy's way of following Jesus wholeheartedly. So once again, we're each going to do it differently. None of us are going to do it perfectly. And it's all about choosing to remember that we're loved by God. So now Erica, Petra's mother, my mother-in-law. Exactly one week on the Sunday before Andy's passing, Petra lost her mother, Erica Finke. Now Andy was young, 63. Erica was 90, full of years, but still very full of life. For a 90-year-old, she was definitely slowing down. Now, Andy's decline was very long, very painful, requiring great faith and courage. Now, Erica died suddenly, peacefully, in her sleep after a day of celebrating her third and final granddaughter's wedding. It was the wedding day. Petra had been over visiting with her mom in Germany for three weeks. They'd had a lovely stay together, our daughter Charlene and her two beautiful children. I might be biased, nevertheless. They were all there together, four generations, just doing all kinds of amazing things in what turned out to be the last three weeks of her life. I wasn't there, but there was a stream of pictures coming back each day, and I was curating those and celebrating those and treasuring those. So two days before Petra was to fly home again, the morning after this amazing highlight of the wedding, Petra woke up to find that her mother had passed away peacefully in the night. They were sleeping a meter away from each other. Petra didn't hear a thing. It was quite a shock. Kind of the opposite of Andy's passing in a blessing kind of way. As one friend said, wow, what a way to go. Partying one day and gone to be with Jesus the next. So let me help you get to know Erica a bit. She was beautiful. She was charming. One of those incredibly, impeccably put together seniors who manages to just be elegant without being showy. She was always thinking of others really living for others, and, and everybody loved her. I know there's a lot of jokes about mothers-in-law, but mine was an angel. Mine was a ray of sunshine. Always welcoming you, serving you, loving you, always finding creative and unexpected ways to bless you, to bring you happiness. Fresh in her marriage, my daughter Charlene found a bottle of uh, my mother-in-law Erica's perfume. And she ran to her husband and said, smell this, smell this. This is the smell of love. <laughs> this is the smell of love. That was Erica. So now Andy and Erica, same, uh, were both high energy people. They're both very capable, always on the move, both incredibly warm and caring, hospitable. Yes, I mean, Petra's mom to the T, hospitality, hospitality, hospitality. And both of them ser servant-hearted, but, but kind of in different ways. Uh, Andy was educated, a thinker, a leader, a man of vision and strategy. Andy did see gifts in you, and he found ways to put you to work. <laughs> But Erica was simple, straightforward. She was a feeler whose life revolved around caring for others and making them happy. Somehow she saw the beauty in you, the part of you that was lovable. And in the way she served you and treated you and loved you, she kind of made it harder and harder for you not to believe that you're lovable. It's quite a gift. Now, honestly, she would never have said this. These are my words. She, she, she would not, could not express these things. But here's what I'll say. Erica helped you to see yourself the way God sees you. 
unconditionally loved, beautiful. Not blind to your faults, but not focusing on them, not treating you that way. Beloved, worth dying for. To know Erica was to be drawn towards accepting that you are acceptable. So when God says you're lovable, we argue just a little bit less. That's a good thing. So Petra and I are going to be flying back to Germany in October for Erica's memorial. There's gonna be a couple of stories told there. I wanted to tell you just two stories. When I was first dating Petra, I was going over to Germany. I got the continent right, I got the country right, but I was at the wrong end of the country, so there was a long drive to go and see Petra. And so on Sunday afternoon, I'd be heading back. Uh, didn't have a lot of money, so I'm hitchhiking with, um, not hitchhiking, uh, uh, catching a ride with a bunch of students, uh, you know, carpooling back for the drive back. And she would come and say, I made you some sandwiches, but it wasn't, that. I made you some sandwiches, and she would hand me a bag that was big enough for the whole car to live on for a week. <laughs> I mean, it was incredible to be driving home and, and just be unpacking. I mean, sandwiches, 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 that was true, but there was drinks, there was cookies, there was marzipan, there was fruit. Um, that was her idea of, I made you some sandwiches for the trip. Uh, another amazing story, uh, many of you know Petra is a rower, kind of a good one, and so she had a team, four other young ladies rowing, and one day their boat capsized and they all fell into very dirty, oily harbor water um, in Germany. It's not like our harbor here. And so, I mean, the clothes for most people would be ruined. <clears throat> they were all cold and wet and tired. They all went to bed. In the morning, they found their clothes washed ironed, folded, and this is the magic trick of Erica, somehow she got all the right clothes back into all the right bags while they slept. It's an angel. Dead serious here now, what did Andy know a lot about? Oh, birds, soccer, leadership, missions, ministries, Bible, theology, that sort of thing. Good stuff, quite cerebral. I asked Petra, what did your mother know a lot about? And uh, she's not, you know, not a simple woman that way. She knew a lot of stuff, but you're not gonna get like school topics here. What did your mother know a lot about? Loving people, serving people welcoming people, seeing people, accepting people, figuring out what was important to them and receiving that, serving that, loving that. In all the years, which is many now, that I knew Erica, I never once saw her misjudge someone I never saw her miss connecting with what was important to them. She just knew how to love. She could always see the good, always managed not just to do, but, but to be unconditional acceptance. We used to tease her about hospitality. It was literally impossible to get her to stay sitting at a table. Every 30 seconds, she'd pop up and go and get something for somebody. Everyone was stuffed from the four courses that we had already eaten. And she would say, oh, would you like this dessert? Oh, no, I could never. She put one on your plate anyway. And, and after three rounds of more and more desserts, people are like cross-eyed from being uh, overly full. And she really would come and press a banana into your hand for the journey home. She would forgive people. She, she knew a lot about overcoming conflict 
reuniting, not holding grudges. She knew a lot about overcoming barriers that separate people. That's who she was. So we could say that Andy was trained in truth with a capital T, and we could say that he was very articulate with the gospel. And I think Erica was also trained in the truth <laughs> and very articulate in sharing the gospel, but in a very different way. She was born and raised German Catholic, lived through the uh, Second World War as a little girl. And that combination meant not a lot of expressed theology, not a lot of thinking, not a lot of words, but a very deep sense of God is good, God is with us, I am loved, you are loved, so I love you. And I can sacrifice for you because I know he's with me. He's gonna take care of everything, it's gonna be okay. So you see, it's exactly like Andy, a completely lived out gospel, and yet very different. Not really thought about, almost never talked about, but like Andy, totally lived out. So that may be you today. You may be more like Andy or you may be more like Erica. But if you don't talk like Andy and you don't have gifts and passions like Andy, and maybe you're a more hidden person, think of this. Andy touched hundreds, even thousands of lives. And Erica touched hundreds, even thousands of lives. Even though she never had a formal role or did anything other than just be Erica. So what does it mean to follow Jesus with all of our heart? It means we're each gonna do it differently. It means none of us are gonna do it perfectly. And it's all about trusting that we're loved by God, accepting his unconditional love for us and then extending that unconditional love to others. So if you are tempted to think he is far away, you need to choose again against your feelings, choose again to believe that he is there with you. If you're tempted to feel unloved or rejected or mistreated because you have been mistreated, then we are to remember that we are loved and forgiven and so we can love and forgive others. Jesus serves them, so we serve them. And when hard things happen, we choose to remember that nothing can separate us from the love of God. He is going through this with us. He is feeling what we are feeling. More accurately, we are feeling what he is feeling. Compassion, together. Erica had a lot of hardship in her life and a lot of blessing too, like me. <laughs> nothing can separate us from the love of God. He is going through this with us. So it means we choose dependence. It means we look outside of ourselves for the strength that we need, the way that Jesus did. Remember, he said, on his own, the son can do a few of the easy things. On his own, the son can do the daily stuff. Nope. On his own, the son can do nothing. Nothing. Erica knew that. Andy knew that. We live lives of dependence on a God who is near and sees and knows and loves and accepts, that is following Jesus wholeheartedly. Quiet, steady faith, choosing to trust. And that brings us to Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth II, who passed away on September the 8th. Uh, you may be surprised to know that I didn't actually know her personally. Um, I kind of doubt she wouldn't recognize me or know my name. That's largely because we never met. Um, but uh, a few years ago, I found this book. <clears throat> there she is, the queen. The title of the book is The Servant Queen and the King She Serves. And it's all about Queen Elizabeth's faith. So I'm going to share a few quotes from Queen Elizabeth for you. She served as queen for 69 years, and even if you're not a fan of the monarchy as an institution, you have to admit she had a pretty profound and positive influence on history, both in Great Britain and internationally. Uh, she never went to university, but she was the advisor and a confidant to over a dozen prime ministers. 
She was the most famous and the most photographed woman in the world, and yet there are no reliable accounts of her losing her temper, using bad language, or refusing to carry out a duty that was expected of her. She employed 1,200 people, but still feeds, fed her own dogs. She was a senior citizen in her 90s, still working 40 hours a week. How do you do that for 69 years? Here is her answer. I know just how much I rely on my faith to guide me through the good times and the bad. Each day is a new beginning. I know that the only way to live my life is to try and do what is right, to take the long view, to give my best in all the day brings, and to put my trust in God. I draw strength from the message of hope in the Christian gospel. I hope that, like me, you will be comforted by the example of Jesus of Nazareth, who often in times of adversity managed to live an outgoing, unselfish, and sacrificial life. He makes it clear that genuine human happiness and satisfaction lie more in giving than receiving, more in serving than being served. I find in Jesus my source of strength and courage. The true measure of Christ's influence is in the good works quietly done by millions of men and women day in and day out throughout the centuries who have been inspired by Jesus' simple but powerful teaching. Love your neighbor as yourself. We need saving from ourselves, from our recklessness or our greed. God sent into the world a unique person, neither a philosopher nor a general, important though they are, but a savior with the power to forgive. For me, the life of Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, is an inspiration and an anchor in my life a role model of reconciliation and forgiveness. He stretches out his hands in love, acceptance, and healing. Christ's example has taught me to seek to respect and value people of whatever faith or no faith. And the role of the established church, of course she is the head of the Church of England, the role of the established church is not to defend Anglicanism to the exclusion of other religions. No, the church has a duty to protect the free practice of faiths, all faiths in this country. One more. Despite being displaced and persecuted throughout his short life, Christ's unchanging message was not one of revenge or violence, but simply that we should love one another. Elizabeth didn't have to go to church every week, but she did. Elizabeth didn't have to speak regularly about praying and needing to be prayed for, but she did. Elizabeth didn't have to consistently reference Jesus Christ as her source of strength, but she did. She spoke often and clearly about her faith in Jesus Christ. So what does it mean to follow Jesus with all of our heart, wholeheartedly, undividedly, undistractedly? We're each going to do it differently. None of us are going to do it perfectly. And it's all about trusting that we're loved by God, choosing that so that we choose to love others, to serve and sacrifice. So Jesus said, follow me, follow me. Follow me into loving the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength. Always believe that you are loved, says Jesus. When you forget, return, remember, repent and turn back to believing that you are loved. Jesus would say to you, I heard that I was loved at my baptism and I had to fight to remember that I am loved out in the desert being tempted. At the heart of this is choosing to remember that we are loved. 
The kingdom of heaven is near, he would say. The kingdom of heaven is here. It's upon you. Repent, change your mind. If you think God is far away, he's not. If you think that God is waiting for you to get your act together, that somehow you have to do the right things, earn your way in, keep the right score. If you think that's what it's about, think again, repent. Don't go down that path. Remember, you are loved. You're already in. Now live that way. We're each gonna do it differently. Queen of England, Andy Perret, <laughs> Erica, right? That's how well known they were. But it's Andy, Erica, Queen of England in their ability to make Christ known. In good times and in hard times, God 